From So Say We All and KPBS in San Diego, welcome to Incoming, the series that brings you true stories from the lives of veterans told in their own words, straight from their own mouths. I'm your host, Justin Hudnall. I am so frickin' excited to bring you today's guest, and I need to explain to our civilian audience why, because he's already a legend among the veteran and military community. Marine Corps veteran Paul Zolder created Duffelblog, the online satirical news site that pillories current events and policy decisions affecting American service members as they happen. Some of the fake headlines and news stories they've had are silly. Other articles are just straight up biting. And among its widely read audience, even retired General Wesley Clark has announced that he is a fan of Duffelblog. You'll get to meet the man responsible right after this NPR Minute. This episode of Incoming is sponsored by Easy. Easy provides customized problem solving for any project, anytime. Whether it's building software and automation for your business, support writing your next book, or something as simple as making a dinner reservation. Learn more at SoEasy.com, spelled S-O-E-A-S-I-E dot com. Welcome back to Incoming. I'm Justin Hudnall, and today we're going to meet Paul Zoldra, creator of Duffelblog. It's not wrong that many people call Duffelblog the onion for the military, but there's an important distinction. Just like the onion, Duffelblog features cutting commentary through humor on modern day issues almost in real time. But whereas The Onion is written by a team of writers, Duffelblog is written by veterans and the military itself. The Duffelblog's so-called press pool is actually a network of service members stationed all over the world, from all branches and ranks, sending in joke news stories that deal with the very issues they face in their careers. It allows them to speak truth to power and mock the absurdities that they have to swallow while wearing the uniform. It restores a sense of individuality, gives the military contributors their voice back, and turns their frustrations into comedy gold. But there's nothing worse than being told a joke is funny before you get to hear it yourself, so let's get right to it. Here's Paul Zoldra. It is so great to be here. So why don't we start off with you walking us through where you were in life when you decided to join the Marine Corps. I I always kind of thought about joining the military. Um, I can remember back in seventh grade, I did this project about basically what you would, what do you want to be when you grow up, and I wrote... Um, I wrote that I either wanted to work with computers, uh, be an astronaut or join the military. And it's kind of funny because I joined the military and I, now I work with computers writing, uh, in a writing capacity, but, um, I'm still waiting to go to space. But, um, I always had that in the back of my mind. My father, uh, served in the army, uh, during the seventies and, um, I wasn't totally sure if I was going to go in the military or not. Uh, I was in high school, a senior, you know, deciding what I wanted to do. And, uh, and then 9-11 happened. And so uh, I walked into my history class. We, uh, we had TVs in, in all our classrooms by that time. And so I walked into my history class and I saw my teacher sitting on his desk. I, I, I believe I was one of the first people to walk in the classroom and he was just sitting on his desk staring at the TV um, and watching the, you know, the, the planes hit the towers and we didn't have a class that day. We just sat there and watched history unfold. Um, you know, that just terrible day in real time. And, um, it was shortly after that, I figured that was kind of, that was it. That was, this was, I should join the military. This is kind of a Pearl Harbor moment where, you know, you, your country is attacked and you need to join and, you know, do your part and that kind of patriotic stuff. And, um, I, I went to the, I went to the recruiting office and, uh, they're all in this, they're all in this big building of, you know, all the services are all in one office space. And, uh, since I was, had that whole space thing I wanted, I figured, I could be a pilot and I could join the Air Force and then I could get the space and obviously not knowing that you have to be an officer to do that. But I walked in and this is a true story. I walked in uh, looking for the Air Force uh, recruiter and the Air Force guy was not there and there was a open door and I hear this voice coming out of the door and he's like, hey, what, what are you looking for? And I, I just kind of 
poke my head in and inside I see this this uh this guy that's just has all kinds of ribbons and everything on his chest and he's wearing this blue outfit with these red and gold chevrons on the side and he had he just looked like a big like a football player and I said um well sir I'm looking for I'm looking for the air force and uh he he says well they're not here why don't you come in and take a seat and I'm just an idiot I don't know what he is or what the marines are like I just I didn't really, I don't think I even knew what the Marines were. Like my dad was in the army. So I just knew that there was an Air Force Army in the Navy. And anyway, I walk in here and here's this guy who's like this barrel chested freedom fighter. He was a, you know, former recon Marine and, you know, telling me all these stories of uh, the training and, and how tough it is and everything like that. And I was, I was kind of hooked. You know, I talked to him and then I said, oh, you know, let me let me think about it. And we set another appointment. I ended up talking to uh, another guy in his office at a later date. And, you know, it's funny. The Marines don't offer you crap like they don't give you anything. The Army, you know, they say, hey, we're going to give you 20 grand to sign up. Or, you know, the Navy says you would give you skills for the future. And the Air Force says we're going to, you know, you can get a technical job and then you can apply it on the outside. Like there's all these benefits that you can get by joining a service the marines are straight up like we're not giving you shit. we don't owe you anything you owe us stuff and it was striking to think about it because he had these little like placard little name kind of they, they look like a name tag right and they had words on them and he he said these are the intangibles that we can give you and it said stuff like leadership and integrity. And I was like, this is awesome. Sign me up. Like, this is great. I signed up and um, my recruiter was uh, an infantry or recon guy and I, I wanted to do the infantry and I ended up going back telling my parents. And uh, well, so my mom was freaked out and she tells me, she's like, you can't go, you know, you're going to be in, you know, all this combat, like it's going to be bad, this and that. And then my recruiter, like slick as hell comes to my mom and she, he talks to her he's like, oh, don't worry. He's going to be the best trained Marine. Like we give, we get all this great training. He's not going to see much, this and that. Like it, it was just smooth. The guy was just so good. But my dad, my dad was in the army. And uh, so he, he basically told me, he's like, he didn't say like, don't do it or, you know, you're, you're stupid or anything. He just goes to me and he's just like straight up. I'll never forget it. He goes, you're going to hate it. You're going to hate this. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> That's the Marine Corps motto. You're going to hate this. Shit. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, I'm like, you know, you don't know what the hell you're talking about. I'm, I'm 18 years old. I'm smarter than you, this kind of thing. And I was like, all right, whatever. And then he tells me before I left, he goes, listen. Don't ever be the first, don't ever be the last, and don't volunteer for shit. And I took that advice, and that was like, that was what I did at boot camp. Like, I'm not going to be a squad leader. Like, they squad leaders at boot camp, they're freaking pushing, doing push-ups for all everybody else's mistakes. But I'm also not going to be the last person. I'm not going to skyline myself. I was just a shadow at boot camp and just trying to do the best I could, and but my dad was kind of right. Like serving with the Marines was great, but just the Marines I served with. But the core itself is like, is this bureaucratic beast that just is, is not as fun as they make it out to be. Well, let's talk <laughs> about your deployments. You've done two. Your first was a Westpac, and then your second was to Afghanistan. Give us a sense of what your tour in Afghanistan was all about. It's, it's funny. Um, before I went this was in, I went in November, 2004 and the year prior, the Iraq war kicked off. And, um, it was a time when you're hearing all these stories of crazy combat going on in Iraq at November, 2004, you had the battle of Fallujah in Iraq. And, um, we did this training at a, at an air force base or something like that, where they had Hollywood people like do this crazy makeup with, 
you know, you'd have this fake RPG explosion and then a guy would come out, like one a dude that was in your platoon with like glass all in his face and blood everywhere. Like it was super realistic. So the training we went through and the kind of stuff that we we uh, trained for with like IED training and, and you know, mass casualty events, all this other, other stuff set us up for this idea that we were going into like into the shit. Like, I'm going into Nam. Like, this is going to be crazy. We are going to get into so many firefights. Like, it's it's nuts, you know. And um, I got there, and it was, it was a seven-month deployment. It was so boring. Like, it was nothing happening. We went to – we were in Kaust, the, the city of Kaust, which is uh, like it's Osama bin Laden's old neighborhood – but this is long gone, you know, 2004. We're at this fob called Fob Salerno. And, you know, it was just every day we went outside the wire, uh, rolled in our Humvees. We had th no up armor whatsoever and just rolling around Afghanistan hoping we get shot at. Like that was it. And we never did. It was to the point where we were like mad that we weren't getting shot at. Like the thing about Marines that's strange to people that have never served or been around is that when we train like we do and then we get to the fight we want to fight like we want to do stuff and when you get there and like nothing's happening it just sucks it's really really terrible so we dug up so many old 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 weapons and like uh, old explosives and mortar rounds and stuff like that my sense was that this was a time when you know, if you're a jihadist, you're deciding where to go and you decide to go to Iraq instead of Afghanistan. Um, and so that's why it was kind of like not happening for us. It wasn't until uh, we did one uh, patrol into the Korangal Valley, which is like one of those like mythical places in Afghanistan. Uh, there was a uh, movie called Restrepo about it. We we went up the road there one time and we got uh, we got hit by an IED. Uh, the the vehicle in front of me got hit, and uh, and that that's it as far as like anything happening. And in that incident, it, it, it still it was like uh, fortunately no one died. It was uh, it was they hit a we had a five vehicle convoy. They hit the one vehicle that was up armored, uh, thankfully, and so it was just kind of bumps and bruises inside the Humvee, and. There was no firefight afterwards. It was just like your typical IED and then the trigger man, whoever the hell that was, he, you know, goes to live on and fight another day. And he was talking shit on the radio to our interpreter saying, ha, 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 we hit the Americans and uh, we didn't know where the hell he was. And that's that's like um, it's kind of how it was for, uh, I'm sure, a lot more people. Hi, my name is Paul Zolger. I'm the founder and editor-in-chief of Duffelblog, and this is a piece I wrote on May 21st, 2018. Headline, Pentagon warns Taliban to surrender 80% of Afghanistan it controls or, quote, face consequences. Washington. Pentagon leaders say the Taliban needs to surrender the vast majority of Afghanistan it controls or it will face, quote, serious consequences, sources confirmed today. Quote, make no mistake, if the Taliban does not give up all the territory it currently controls, we will have no choice but to do the same thing we've been doing for the past 17 years, plus like 10 percent, said Patrick Shanahan, Deputy Secretary of Defense. The call for Taliban members to put down their arms and begin negotiating a truce came just days after the insurgent group took over a number of major cities, executed a daring raid on the U.S. Embassy in Kabul, and destroyed various government schools and office buildings in the countryside. With its latest offensive, the Taliban has become more powerful than the U.S.-backed Afghan government in more than three-quarters of the country, although American officials said one Afghan pilot just figured out how to fly a Black Hawk helicopter, so those losses should be reversed any day now. Quote, we're making incredible progress here, said Army spokesman Lieutenant Colonel Billy Grogan for the 30,000th time over the past 14 years that he has spoken of Afghanistan as he's risen in the ranks of military public affairs. Officials added that its most recent offensive on drug labs and poppy fields is denying the Taliban its most important source of revenue, which will surely lead them to bargain with an ineffective and dysfunctional governmental organization in addition to Afghan officials.
When reached for comment, Taliban officials told reporters they were seriously considering giving up a fight they'd been waging for the past 30 years against fellow Afghans and foreign invaders if the United States continued to bomb their compounds from an altitude of 25,000 feet. A lot of your articles, a lot of your satire is about Afghanistan. And like you said, you joined after 9-11 with this Pearl Harbor motivation fueling you. When did the fact that Afghanistan seemed to not be wrapping up anytime soon, that there was no triumphant victory, kind of check your morale? Um, I, I believed in it for a long time, even after I got out. I believed the idea that if only – and people still hold this view – if only we just unleashed the U.S. military, if only we didn't have these damn rules of engagement, we could just go scorched earth and we could subdue uh, everyone with our military might that we're going to win there, which doesn't work. I mean the Soviets went scorched earth. They didn't win, um, and they turned the population against them, uh, and then you know we helped, uh, we helped them with the stingers, but um, – I believed it for a long time. I remember writing a, a, a like a contributed piece to Business Insider along that same vein of of hey, we need to you know give our people our uh, the rules of engagement, loosen them up, that kind of thing. But I guess where it changed was just when I think back and is like time and maturity and thinking back on my time there. I don't believe I should have been there at that period of time. Um, if you if if I really am thinking honestly with myself and what we had done, we were in the beginning stages of this transition from fighting to building up a government and trying to, you know, install democracy in a place where it's never really taken hold. And, you know, we weren't doing fighting. We weren't doing what the traditional U.S. military role is. So – you know, if I had my way, and I, I mean, this, this has been said by many other people smarter than me, you know, after the invasion, you topple the Taliban, you root out Al Qaeda, and you get the hell out of there. Like, we didn't really have any any reason to stick around and, and do this, this building of a government. Um, it just rooted us, it, it, it set us up for this failure that we're, we're engaged in now. So, and, you know, that was kind of the – that was kind of what it was. I mean I didn't – I don't feel like I did much. I, I, I don't feel I had – I made really a difference in Afghanistan. When did that switch happen? You said you were still kind of gung-ho when you termed out of the military. When did it start to get under your skin? Um, well, so when I got out of the Marines, I went to – I went to college and I did – I went to school for business and – um that was around the time I started Duffel Blog, and so I was working on that. And so um, I don't, you know, there wasn't any kind of like aha moment, but I think it's just hearing from other other people um, and meeting other people. Like through Duffel Blog, I met with a whole lot of other service members who have had various experiences, whether they're the army or they were, you know, navy or whatever, and they were in Afghanistan and, and it's and it turns out that they have the similar what the hell was I doing kind of stuff and similarly skeptical about it and what was happening there. And then uh, for me, I think what really gets me super pissed off is the constant like generals and public affairs people who are putting lipstick on a pig, they're today. I mean, you look on DOD's website today, I haven't looked, but I'm sure it's there. You can see stuff about like the, the South Asia strategy is working. Trump's new South Asia strategy is, is really having an effect, which was implemented a year ago. But if you look at the DOD's own internal numbers on the amount of, of territory that the government of Afghanistan controls – uh, versus the Taliban, it has not changed in the past year, even though there's this supposedly quote unquote new strategy. And um, it's just, it, it's like, I, I read a lot of books. I read a ton of military history. It's like strikingly similar to the crap you hear from Vietnam and like the constant, you know, glowing assessments of things. We'll be right back with today's guest, Paul Zoldra, after this. You're listening to Incoming. 
Welcome back to Incoming. Today we're talking with Paul Zoldra, creator of the satirical military news site, Duffelblog. Hi, my name is Paul Zoldra. I'm a columnist at Task and Purpose, and this is a piece I wrote on March 29th, 2018. Headline. Does General Dunford actually believe his own bullshit? I often wonder whether four-star generals actually believe their own bullshit. That thought has crossed my mind more than once after reading quotes from General Joseph Dunford, the current chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. You see, old Fightin' Joe has been in the news quite a bit lately, since he recently took a trip over to Afghanistan to learn firsthand how everything is shaping up. Predictably, he returned and told us that yes, there are a few issues here or there still to be worked out, but quote, he's encouraged by the progress in Afghanistan, some 17 years after the first American boots were on the ground. Does Dunford actually buy this sales line of, quote, progress that has been offered ad nauseum by just about every general in Afghanistan for the past 10 years? Or how about another DOD news item from a week ago when Dunford talked up the, quote, fundamentally different strategy of advising and assisting Afghan security forces that was recently implemented by the Trump administration? He told reporters traveling with him that 2018 was, quote, not another year of the same thing we've been doing. Really, Joe? I'd like to fact check you for a moment here if I could. Back in February 2013, Dunford assumed command of all NATO forces in Afghanistan, where he oversaw the drawdown of U.S. troops for 18 months. He also put his name and signature on a document explaining the coalition strategy of advising and assisting Afghan security forces, which began in late 2011. The document, which was an unclassified guidebook, offered highlights on the advisory mission and explained that soldiers should, quote, adopt a specific mindset of working by, with, and through the Afghan security forces. Sound familiar? This was from July 2014. It was, in essence, a broad 72-page outline of a strategy where U.S. forces would embed at all levels of Afghanistan's military and government and offer their advice and mentorship as Afghan forces improved enough so the U.S. could finally leave. Quote, the years of investment in combat-oriented mentoring and advising has paid off, the guide said, noting that Afghans began to take the lead starting with the 2013 fighting season. Now back to the present. The supposedly new strategy called for assistance to Afghan security forces, just like we've been doing, minus the Obama administration's timetable for withdrawal. Meanwhile, the Army stood up a new unit called the 1st Security Force Assistance Brigade with the express purpose of carrying out the same mission. It plans to slowly roll out five more, according to its reenlistment recruiting website. SFAB's job is to support Afghan security forces, which, again, have been receiving training from the U.S. and other NATO partners for over a decade, who are still widely illiterate, suffer casualty rates, quote, often described as unsustainable, and continue to be relying on air support from the U.S., according to a Congressional Research Service report out earlier this month. The truth is, we're not doing anything, quote, fundamentally different in Afghanistan, as Dunford and many other generals would like you to believe. I personally conducted joint patrols alongside Afghan security forces all the way back in 2004, as our company commander regularly met with them and government officials to help them fight the Taliban. But maybe those didn't count. Dunford knows we're doing the same old shit we've always done there. Training an inept foreign military backed by a corrupt government that will crumble as soon as we pull up chocks. But he won't tell you that. And as long as Congress keeps dumping money into a war that will never be won, he'll continue to bullshit us all. I'm, I'm super frustrated. I get a DOD casualty report and I think like, what, what the hell? Like... If I were serving there and I got killed, I don't know what the hell, like, you would tell my parents. What would it have been for? Yeah, it would just, like, piss me off. If you said, like, 2003 or whatever, like, but now it's kind of like we're there and our government is propping up another government. And I don't see the, I don't see the connection that is continually made to, like, preventing the next 9-11. Like, terrorists can launch an attack from anywhere else they don't need to hang around afghanistan so well that kind of rolls me over i know you've told me that you are uh asked to death about the origin story of duffel blog but it sounds like i would infer that that frustration you were feeling would have led to kind of the motivation to start it but correct me if i'm wrong 
Um, you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the, the, well, it was a different frustration. The, the frustration I had, and you can see it in the, the original articles that we were at Duffelblog were all about these like little inside military frustrations. Like my commanding officer has us waiting outside in formation for 45 minutes. We're just standing there waiting for him to come out. Like that's a frustration. You know, you're like, what the hell? Or first sergeant won't stop giving you a liberty briefing on a Friday night and it's taken him two hours because he has to go through all the bad things that you're not supposed to do. Um, or, you know, the chow hall, that's the foods there is terrible. It was these like small little insider things. It wasn't really the national like Pentagon stuff. Um, we've kind of morphed into doing that stuff more. And um, so when I started, it was just kind of this fun thing. Hi, my name is Paul Zoldra. I'm the founder and editor-in-chief of Duffelblog, and I'm going to read a piece from June 29th, 2018. Headline, Recently Discharged Soldier Gains Veteran 214, Austin, Texas. A man who recently left the U.S. Army has gained the inevitable Veteran 214 before starting college classes on the GI Bill. Jason Ennis, 22, received an honorable discharge from the service in January, but he quickly shed his military appearance and gained a couple hundred pounds to better fit in with his veteran colleagues. He also grew a large beard in order to hide his double chin and celebrate his freedom from having to shave and look presentable, according to sources. Though less well known as an expression than the freshman 15, most who have previously served in the military are aware of the phenomenon of getting the Veteran 214, which has a dual meaning of gaining at least 214 pounds after a service member gains their DD-214 discharge document. The weight gain is often caused by increased alcohol intake, consumption of cookies and brownies laced with marijuana, and a lack of physical exercise with the exception of beer curls. In addition to his weight gain, sources say Ennis has fully completed his transition from service member to professional veteran after he placed a Freedom Isn't Free, I Paid For It bumper sticker on his truck and posted a selfie video from the driver's seat of his 19-minute complaint about gays and liberals to Facebook. Ennis plans to start working out again sometime next year, according to sources familiar with the matter. So I went to school for business. I was working on a business idea. Um, so I was at the University of Tampa and they have an entrepreneurship program that's really great. And one of the things we have to do is we have to like – we have to start with a, uh, a feasibility study on a business idea that we want to tr uh, create. And then by the end of uh, – you know, by the time you get your degree, you're supposed to have a business plan for that business. And so I started on a path of – thinking about what frustrated me getting out of the military. And one of the things that was tough for me was figuring out where to go to school. And how I figured out how to go to University of Tampa was very simple and really stupid. I was getting out. I was going to Florida. And so I looked in a magazine that's called GI Jobs. It's on all the bases everywhere. And I looked at the cost of University of Tampa versus University of South Florida and the enrollment. And since I wasn't paying for it, and I was on the GI Bill. I figured, hey, like it costs more. It must be better. Um, turns out my gambit was correct, <laughs> but uh, there are plenty of other people who don't make the right choice. Like they go to the University of uh, – well, I won't name the names, but some online online university or some other kind of scammy school and not really thinking about the full potential that they might uh, find at you know a bigger, bigger university. So um, I started on this – Thing I wanted to do called collegeveteran.com, which is now defunct, but it was pitched as like a, like a Yelp for college for veterans. That was kind of the idea. And from that and me kind of failing forward and like figuring out marketing and that kind of thing, I started some blogs and one of them just happened to be Duffel Blog. And I just thought of the name. I thought it was kind of catchy and it kind of worked. And I'm a big fan still of The Onion, but when they do military stuff, it's definitely um, – you can tell that they don't have writers that are military. You know, they, they, were, they refer to a – like a guy that's in Marine uniform as a soldier, which is if you 
if you're around Marines, they get really pissed off about it. And I figured, hey, I, I could do this. This, this. this can't be that hard. It, it really is. But um, that's kind of where it started. And I started with um, myself writing everything. I wrote, uh, I wrote my first article and then I wrote something like one a week and then I changed it to maybe two a week. And uh, after about a month or so of it just being me, I got this email from a soldier in Kuwait. He was in Kuwait. He was deployed there. And he says, hey, man, I, I love Duffelbog. I love what you're doing. This is absolutely hilarious. Can I write for you? And I had not thought about having any writers or anything like that. It was just this idea that was supporting my real idea. And I said, yeah, sure. I, I can't pay you anything. It's just like for fun. And he said, no, no, I'm, I'm super bored. Like, let me do this. And uh, and that was kind of how that started. And from that one person and that one uh, soldier, now we have, you know, we're six years later and we have 100 plus contributors, uh, all the different services, um, all the different ranks. Um, we don't have any generals, but <laughs> we have uh, – officers enlisted and they've really made the site what it is. I mean, it's been incredible and they're the the writing of the contributors has just been absolutely fantastic. If it were just me, I feel like I would have run out of material like 5 years ago or something right. or it's been really great and I've also learned so much more about the military than I would have otherwise because I have all these different people and all these different uh, different experiences talking about their little bugaboos and what they were, you know, annoyed by while they, while they were in uniform and then they pitch headlines and, and, uh, we go from there. Yeah. I was going to ask, I mean, part of the ticket you sign on for when you become a service member is you don't really get to complain much publicly or question orders or policy or any of that. And so I attribute, you know, at least for myself, that to being why Duffel Blog is so revered among the branches because it's this outlet of satirical truth and saying things that everybody thinks but no one's really allowed to vent when did you realize that you'd really hit the vein of frustration or or you know entertainment or however you want to phrase it that was being craved well i like to say that uh when i was in the marine corps my sphere of influence i was a let's say i was at when i was a lance corporal you know i'm sitting in formation or i'm standing in formation and i have my buddies to my left and my right and you know maybe the co is not coming out of his office and i would go to you know jones next to me and be like man the co is such a douche like i wish he would come out of the freaking office and uh, i'm like yeah man absolutely like this sucks man i just want to you know go play video games or something and um that was it you know i basically had like my circle of two or three, or whoever's around me. And that's how it is for a lot of people in the military. You have your little, tiny little bubble. The military isn't all like salute and we just do everything we're asked. Like people complain a lot, you know? And, um, but your complaints are basically directed to your peers because you can't really complain to the people above you. And so with Duffel Blog, what's really great about it is that you can be that same rank I mean, you can be a Lance Corporal and write for Duffel Blog or be a specialist or whoever, and your article with your complaints in a funny manner, you know, satirically speaking truth to power, will actually be read in some instances by the people in power. And it's crazy to think about that, to think that um, articles we have where we've made fun of, like General Dunford when he was when he went to Afghanistan. Uh, I have been told that he read it at the time before he went to Afghanistan. Like, that's crazy to me. That is nuts. Or, you know, the stuff about the Pentagon doing this or that and the knowledge to know that Secretary Mattis has read Duffel Blog, loves Duffel Blog, has spoken great things about it. And so to think that you can actually reach him in his bubble of an office where you'd never have a say – if you're some, you know, E5 or, you know, O2 or something in the military, that's crazy. Yeah, it's, it's a complete subversion of history. Yeah. Uh, but again, 
I say like it's really nice to reach them, but I don't know if we're having an effect. Right. You know, like I don't I don't hold any like delusions of grandeur to think that we can change Pentagon policy, and I don't think we do. A lot of the writers, including myself, it's a form of therapy. It's not really about like it's just getting out your your complaints in a more constructive manner right. and also entertaining a whole lot of people in the process. Hi, my name is Paul Zolder. I'm the founder and editor-in-chief of Duffel Blog, and this is a piece I wrote on September 11, 2017. Headline, Soldier Avenges 9-11 by Giving $100 Bills to Corrupt Afghan Contractor, Kabul. 16 years after September 11, 2001, a soldier deployed to Afghanistan is avenging the devastating terrorist attacks of that day by handing out $100 bills to corrupt contractors in his area of responsibility. Quote, it's a really somber day here to reflect, said Sergeant First Class Stephen Baker. But we just need to remember that we are doing our part to take down these terrorist networks so they can't do anything like that to us again by handing out millions of dollars that will end up in the hands of the Taliban. In addition to doling out thousands of dollars every day to Afghans for construction projects such as schools kids won't ever attend, barracks for Afghan army troops they won't live in, and $10,000 bridges over rivers that are made from sticks and mud, Baker also fights terrorism by handing out pens and pencils to children they can later use as shrapnel for improvised explosive devices. Quote, this is exactly what I signed up for, Baker said. My recruiter really dazzled me with stories of fighting an enemy I'd never see or understand. And then he told me about trying to enact democracy in foreign countries, and I was totally sold. Baker first deployed to Afghanistan as a specialist in 2002, where he helped lose the trail of Osama bin Laden during Operation Anaconda. But over 11 subsequent deployments to Afghanistan, he's noticed an incredible amount of progress. Quote, When we first got here, the Afghans used to just ask us to build everything for them, Baker said. But now, they have taken charge of their own country by asking us for money so they can build it themselves. You know, satire historically has always been the weapon that allows people to speak truth to power. But now that we live in this era where the real actual news is so absurd, I imagine some people have a hard time telling or when they read your, one of your articles or it's shared with them if it's fact or fiction. How much hate mail have you gotten with people mistaking what you're doing as like an actual <laughs> piece? Well, I, we don't get a lot of hate mail so much, but I will say that it's, I'll call it fascinating. It's been very fascinating uh, to be running Duffel Blog in the era of Trump. Um, when it started in 2012, President Obama was in office. And so he was the only president that we ever had while Duffel Blog was, was in existence. And we're a satire website and we try to be nonpartisan and we just make fun of everyone. You know, we made fun of uh, President Obama many, many times. He's the commander in chief. Of course, he's going to be made fun of. We made fun of the defense secretary, Chuck Hagel, and we made fun of Martin Dempsey. We made fun of everybody. And it's been really interesting to see when we make fun of uh, Trump early on in the presidency, our fan base, as you would imagine in the military, is it kind of skews a little bit to the right. And so they would get super mad. Like we'd get comments. It was like, oh, duffel blog has turned liberal. You know, you're going against Trump. What the hell? And it's like, we're not going against Trump. We're just – we're making fun of him because he's the commander in chief. I mean if Obama – stayed in office for, you know, another four years, we'd keep making fun of him. If it was Hillary, we'd make fun of her. It's been really weird having that dynamic where everything's so polarized and everything's like super political now. The idea of making fun of the president, which is like basically as uh, as old as having a president. I mean, you look back to the, like the pamphleteers in the, you know, American Revolution. They were making fun of like George Washington and everybody else or like the king. Like that's as American as apple pie is to use your freedom of speech to make fun of the people in power. And people getting mad about it is just, it's been really weird. Incoming with Paul Zolder. We'll be right back after this. Welcome back to Incoming and our guest today, Marine veteran and Duffel Blog founder, Paul Zoldra. 
Hi, my name is Paul Zolder. I'm the founder and editor-in-chief of Duffelblog, and I'll be reading a piece I wrote on February 27th, 2018. Headline, Trump awards self Medal of Honor for hypothetically saving everyone during school shooting. Washington. President Donald Trump awarded himself the nation's highest award for bravery on Tuesday for hypothetically saving countless lives during a recent shooting at a South Florida high school, sources confirmed today. The president acted with, quote, remarkable courage to theoretically subdue the shooter, according to his award citation for the Medal of Honor, and, quote, reflected great credit upon himself in keeping with the highest traditions of the Trump organization. Quote, you don't know until you test it, but I think I really believe I would have run in there even if I didn't have a weapon, Trump said on Monday, criticizing the response of police officers on the scene. Quote, they weren't exactly Medal of Honor winners, but I am, believe me. Actor Mark Wahlberg, who hypothetically rushed a terrorist and saved everyone on 9-11, agreed with the president's assessment. Senior defense officials say that soon after reports came in of a shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, the 71-year-old fancifully took command of the presidential helicopter and flew it to the school, where he hypothetically landed before apparently running into the school and ripping out the shooter's throat with his fantastically large hands. Trump was theoretically covered in blood during the incident, according to sources. He ideally saved countless lives that day, according to White House officials. Quote, thank God our president's ego is massive and completely bulletproof, said Representative Devin Nunez of California. At press time, the president was thanking himself for receiving such an incredible award, since it's something he said he had always wanted. The thing with with Trump that's been really hard is that, like you said, it is difficult to figure out what is uh, what is satirical and what's just Trump being Trump. I mean, he speaks off the cuff so much, and he, uh, objectively speaking, says some really outlandish stuff. That's not even a liberal conservative point. I think we can all agree on that. Like a great example is we did this article for uh, Memorial Day. Well, basically, Trump uh, tweeted on Memorial Day, this is a real tweet, okay? He says, quote, Happy Memorial Day. Those who died for our great country would be very happy and proud at how well our country is doing today. Best economy in decades, lowest unemployment numbers for blacks and Hispanics ever, and women in 18 years, rebuilding our military, and so much more. Nice. (laughs) Real tweet. Not making it up, I, that was literally what his Memorial Day message was right. that morning. So as a satirist, what do you do with that? I'm like, holy crap, I can't, one, I can't believe the President of the United States tweets that, writes that in any form. You know, like, the only thing, the, the easiest job as a president to do on Memorial Day is to say, Thank you for so much for the brave men and women of the U.S. military who died in service to this nation. Have a great Memorial Day. Remember them. Something like that. Like it's a boilerplate thing. You know, it's like your age just feed you a thing to say. But to make it about yourself and how, you know, you've turned around the economy and you're doing all I was just like blown away. I was not alone in in the duffel blog world of uh, writers. Everybody was like, holy crap, I can't believe this is actually happening. And so we had an article in response, which is the headline was, to make fun of him, dead veterans agree with President Trump, are happy and proud of low unemployment numbers, in which we then uh, went and basically interviewed a quote unquote interviewed a whole bunch of veterans who were, you know, fake veterans, of course. Uh, interred in various places like the Revolutionary War veteran Robert Jones and talking about how awesome Trump is and all these other people. I thought this was a pretty good article, kind of skewed the president for just a really stupid tweet. But I was talking with a a Marine buddy of mine uh, soon after this, and he, um, he had read the article. He thought the tweet was fake. He didn't know that we were basing it off of a real thing. Right. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't know what to do there. I right. you know it's just like, well, I don't think you're alone in that. Yeah. I just don't know. I mean, it's just, um, we, you know, whenever, whenever we skew something, you know, real, like we go and we, uh, 
we link to the actual points, but I'm uh, I'm continually impressed by I, I every time I think like uh, I'm shocked by whatever the latest headline is. They uh, they always beat it. They always beat the last one. Like I'm I'm shocked all the time. Hi, my name is Paul Zolger. I'm the founder and editor in chief of Duffel Blog, and this is a piece I wrote on July 26, 2017. Headline. F-35 can't believe how much the military spends on transgender troops. An F-35 fighter jet can't believe how much transgender troops cost the military after it looked up the figures following tweets from President Donald Trump saying they should no longer serve due to the price tag. Quote, they spend how much on transgender medical services? 8.4 million? My God, that's like four screws and a couple of bolts on my ejection seat. The F-35 told reporters in between sips of cognac during its lunch break, quote, I'm so glad Trump is ending this disgraceful waste of military spending. Trump on Wednesday announced a change in policy for transgender service members in the traditional method of past presidents by tweeting out his guidance following extensive interagency policy discussions on the issue with himself. The Pentagon referred all questions back to the White House since so many people in the building were discussing the change and have been busy doing so for the past 10 minutes. The F-35, for its part, supported the president's announced ban on transgender service members since it would save the Pentagon a huge amount of money that it could spend elsewhere in meaningful ways, like continuing to lose the war in Afghanistan. Quote, I can't believe they're going to pay $140,000 just for some guy to get his d- chopped off when they could use that money to keep me in the air for 10 whole seconds, the F-35 said. Specialist Jason Binghamton, a soldier stationed overseas in Afghanistan that's costing the Pentagon about $1 million annually, was also shocked by the budget-busting figure of transgender medical services. Quote, doesn't the DOD have better things to spend its money on? With this money going to transgender people, we could get like two bombs to drop on the Taliban that would have no strategic impact. Going back to something you said earlier, can you give us your definition of what a professional veteran is? <laughs> yeah, actually, a professional veteran is a funny. I came up with uh, it was not my term that I uh, figured out. A member of the Pat Tillman uh, Foundation or one of their scholars uh, asked me a question about veterans who you know wear the hats with Operation Whatever. And the the shirts that's that has like I served F U and like just all this gear with like cargo pants and you know the the bumper sticker all over their trucks and I guess a professional veteran in my view is is a veteran who can't let it go. You know, like I'm a veteran. I am proud of my service. I have a small little license plate holder on my car that says u.s marine corps mostly to get off speeding tickets but i'm not like plastering my car with everything and i'm not putting it all over um social media and i'm not opening up arguments with as a veteran i have to say that my view blah 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 which is oh is way better than yours because as a veteran i'm speaking from that perspective. My view is that you should be proud of your service. You should be, um, you should definitely be happy with what you did in the, in, in the military and carry that with you for the rest of your life and, and carry those values. But you don't need it to, it's not the best thing you've ever done in your life. There's a, there's this meme that's been around the military quite a bit. It's got a guy that's, it's a Marine in a firefight He's shooting his weapon, and then it says PTSD, the feeling that you're never going to be as cool as this was ever again. That is absolutely ridiculous. When you get out of the service, you're going to be freaking awesome because you have all this military experience, and you're going to figure out how to get a job and be the best person in that job because veterans are way better at these jobs, I believe, than just your average civilian, they just have hard working ethic and, you know, they're, they're better equipped to do what they're asked and do them rapidly and do the best they can. You know, I got out and I went to college and I tried my best there and I got a job in the media. Those things were better than my military service. And having a son is better than me serving in the Marine Corps. Whatever is next in my life, like I'm going to try to do the best I can. And I feel like 
the military or the Marine Corps was a great thing at the time. It was a job. The job is over. And now I need to move on and do something else and try to put all my emphasis into that. Paul Zoldra, on behalf of all of my veteran friends, you're doing a heroic work. We hope you keep going for many more years. Thanks for being on Incoming. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm definitely not a hero, but I'm trying my best. Paul may not think of himself as a hero, but creating laughter out of the most frustrating, hypocritical, and depressing parts of a person's job is a pretty impressive feat. Especially when you're not able to regularly see a good therapist because, say, you're stuck on some forward operating base, or even worse, 29 palms. And unless our government suffers from a sudden onset of reason and compassion, it does not look like Duffelblog is going to run out of dumb shit to make fun of anytime soon. If you want to be one of those contributors making the jokes, go fill out Duffelblog's contributor application on their website. Read some of their hilarious work at duffelblog.com. You can even search past articles based on branch of service, which is really handy if you're in a pinch to come up with something to make fun of your Coast Guard friends with. You definitely won't regret it. And that's our show. Incoming is produced by myself, Justin Hudnall. Our editor is Jennifer Pepperpot Corley. At KPBS, Kurt Conan is radio production manager. Emily Jankowski is technical director. Kinsey Moreland is podcast coordinator. Lisa Jane Morissette is operations manager. And John Decker is director of programming. Music in this episode was provided by the artists Lobo Loco, The Starry Tides, Glass Boy, Uncle Lou, Factory Sounds, and Good Old Neon. Incoming is made possible by the KPBS Explorer Fund, the California Arts Council's Veterans Initiative in the Arts, the City of San Diego's Commission for Arts and Culture, and the supporting members of So Say We All. You can find us on the web and learn more at sosayweallonline.com. Please do subscribe to Incoming, drop us a rating and a review through Apple Podcasts or wherever else you do your podcasting. And if you'd like to get in touch with us, we'd love to hear from you by email at info at sosayweallonline.com. Thanks for listening. Let's talk again soon.